Hi. Um, we'll, I think we'll, we'll get started. We have a good few people coming in and I see the numbers are continuing to go up, so we'll get started. Um, okay. So I should do a quick introduction. So my name is Sarah Donahue and I'm the development officer and the women's sport lead for Babington, Ireland. Delighted to be bringing you this, this webinar tonight it's entitled The Conversation with Gail M, um, which is during our Women in Sport Week, which is brilliant. Um, just before we get started, I want to say a couple of things. Firstly, I want to say a big thank you to Trudy Kennedy from Munster Babington for her, her help in organising this webinar. Without her, her, we wouldn't be here tonight. So with that, I'd like to extend a massive thank you to Trudy. Um, then just in terms of Zoom itself, briefly run through some housekeeping Zoom features for the webinar. So as most of you may, as all of you may know, there's a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So if you ever want to ask a question, pop it in at any time during the webinar and we'll have a Q&A section towards the end um, where Michael O'Mara will be coming on to facilitate that Q&A. So as I said, pop it in at any time you want. Um, there is the option to send them anonymous, anonymously <laughs> if you don't <laughs> want your name called out. So just you have that option as well. So obviously Gail is here herself. I, I'm yeah. going to flatter you a little bit here, Gail. That's okay with you. So two-time Commonwealth Games champion, European and world champion, and also, as most people will know, an Olympic silver medalist, which yeah. is brilliant. And we're delighted she joined <laughs> us here today um, to do a talk with us all. So we're very grateful to have guest, uh, a guest with the reputation that Gail has. And I, for one, can't wait uh, for, for, the, for the webinar today. So um, look, without, without further ado, um, I'll pass it over to Gail and hope we get started. So thanks, Gail. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I'm um, honestly, I feel very, very welcome, and it to kind of know that so many people have come on board and to listen to little on me. So thank you very, very much. I want to say a big thank you. I know Sarah's mentioned it as well, but I want to I want to also say a big thank you to Trudy because Trudy and I have been emailing away, going blah, 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 uh, sorting dates out, times, and everything. And Trudy, do you know what? Everyone needs a Trudy in their life. So Trudy, a massive, massive thank you for me because without you, this would not be happening. So thank you very, very, very much indeed. Um, I want this to be uh, for you guys, okay? So I know I'll be talking for the little bit at the start, but I want you to ask me the questions. So I want you to be... Right, how can I get into Gail's brain? What can I ask her about this? What can I ask her about that? I, am, I will tell you now, I'm very, very honest. I will not shy away from a question and sometimes it might not be the answer that you're expecting. But that's what I like. I want to be honest with anything when it comes to sport because when you are on a badminton court or in a sports field, you, you can't hide. It has to be the true you. And I think so many people hide in um, ego and they hide as a character on courts. And sometimes we lose the real essence of sport. Now we're all sports fans, we're all badminton fans. That's why we're here. And that feeling when you're on a badminton court, when you just, you're in that moment, you're in that zone and you're on that court and you're playing the game and the shots are collecting and that feeling, that is what you, that's your true self. And that's what I want to really kind of get out and about how we can harness this, how can we keep that love of the sport and how can we improve ourselves? Because as we know in sport, it will be, there is never ever a straight line from here to here. There will be, you know, I, there's lots of tick boxes and you know, well, if you do this and you do this, do this, you will get here. As we know in life and in sport, it's never the case. It will be a roller coaster of up downs, round the, round the corners, loop the loops, upside down, woo, off the track, come back on, and who knows what's going to happen. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how to harness those skills of learning and loving the ups and downs, learning that and loving the roller coaster. There was never, ever a straight line for me. I will tell you that now. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my story and a bit about the background and why I believe it's important for every person to do their own bit of self-reflection, to do their own bit of, oh yeah, actually, I learned so much from that person and that person inspired me. And actually, how do I learn to get, you know, on that road? Who do I need to get, you know, um, back on the roller coaster or whatever it is? So that's what I really want to talk to you guys today. And like I say, ask those questions, okay? Michael is going to be like, Oh my God, I got so many questions. That's what I want. I want, you know, I want too many questions, okay? So that's what, we're, that's what we want to do today. 
Um, so I talk, I talk a lot about the why. Why did I get into sport? And, you know, why did sport and me connect, and why badminton connect in, in particular? Um, so I have a bit of a background in sport and the fact that my mum was actually very, very sporty herself. It's Women's Sport Week. Uh, well, it's women's, it was International Women's Day and on Monday. So we've got that, that female uh, focus at the moment, which is so, so important. And I want to stress how important it is to have female role models. Um, girls in particular need close female role models. They, it's harder for girls to idolise. And that's why it's so important to get the teachers, the, the mums, the aunties, that connection and coaches as well. Female coaches, big, big passionate about that. We need them so prominent with girls in sport. The more we can get this going, because girls need that, like I say, emotional connection. Girls need, why am I going to do this sport? And the reason why I do sport is because I had a very sporty mother and she made sport normal for me. Um, okay, so, so normal for us was very, very not normal <laughs> for a lot of people. So my mum was a footballer. My mum actually played women's football for England. So she was a little bit unique. Um, so she was part of the 1971 Women's World Cup that was out in Mexico City. She was part of that maverick team that went out there. And when she came back to England, so she played in front of 90,000 people in the Azteca Stadium. And when she got back to England, the FA banned her for two years for going out there because they said women shouldn't be playing football. So my mum had already had, you know, what should have been the most amazing, and it was the most amazing time of her life. And when she came back, she really wanted to build on it. But because women's football was deemed unsuitable or, you know, just wasn't right, she got, to she got completely demoralized and she got completely disillusioned with it. So she basically gave up. So when I came along, she wanted, obviously, this, you know, we're still really, really sporty, but she didn't want to teach me football because there was still nowhere for me to go. There was still nothing for girls to play football. So in the end, you know, even though my mum was like, right, come on, let's go on our bikes, let's go and play tennis, let's go um, do this. You know, I was knackered growing up. I really, really was knackered. She was also a pretty good badminton player. She played down the local badminton club in Bedford, where I'm from. And it was a tin hut, you know, it was a typical badminton hall. In fact, it was that freezing cold tin hut, no heating in the winter, a sweat box in the, in the summer. You know, you know the ones, we've all played in them in the club evenings. Three courts, that was it. Really slippy floor. Um, it was basic as anything. But that's where we live. We live around the corner from it. My mum was like, come on, you let's like, have play a bit of badminton. Um, and I probably was about four, four years old at the time when my mum introduced me to the sport. And I'll say this over and again, there was no magic when I held a badminton racket for the first time. I literally missed it over and over again. But this is where role models come into effect. And this is why I want you guys to think of someone who was there for you at the start. And, and, and remembering those emotions of someone going, come on, you can do this. Don't worry. Don't give up. Because we do want to give up if we can't do something for the first time. And my mum was there. And she was there going, you know, you can do this. It will be okay. And we need that in life. We need that more than ever right now, especially in this pandemic. We need the people that give us that energy, that tell us that don't give up, tomorrow is another day. Those are the kind of things that in sport we need desperately because we cannot do it on our own. And having that person, someone at such a young age, having my mum, you know, to kind of do that for me, it does lift you. And, you know, when you do hit it, you're like, oh, my God, I'm amazing. And this is what I love about sport is because we'll get something and we'll do it we'll get better and then we're just like oh my god you know heads go up shoulders go back we love it because we are improvement we're improving and seeing improvement is fantastic for confidence um I think I was about seven and um I think my mum muttered the words would you like a game of badminton and I just went oh my god I'm playing against my hero this would be amazing she thrashed me 11 nil. I mean there was no niceties she smacked that you know shuffle around the court and I was just like <laughs> Oh my God, you know, uh, mum, hello, I'm seven. Um, you know, I've had therapy about it, so it's fine. I can talk about it now. Um, you know, I've spoken to my mum about it and I just sort of went, you know, why, why did you do that to me? Just like, well, how did you make it? How did you feel about it? I was like, you know exactly how it felt because I just dropped massively on that court. I was like, right, so it became an obsession to get this one point of my mum. So anyone who came around the house, it's like, come on, 
let's get in the back garden, let's practice because I want to get a point of mum. I joined the junior club, you know, it became like, I must get this one point. And of course, obviously, as we know, the more you practice, the better you get. And I did get that one point. And then I got two points and you so on and you build up. But what I, what I know is that my mum recognised the fact that she never pushed me. It, it was my choice to want to get better. You know, she calls it good parenting. It's a debatable. But what she did do is recognise something inside of me. And we are very, very quick to kind of dismiss this sometimes in coaching. It's all about the skill or it's all about, you know, can they do that shot? But actually, recognizing personality and training a personality is just as important as how they do a shot. And my mom recognized how to work me, basically. How, how would I get better? If she gave me points, I would have got bored. But by beating me every single time and being ruthless with it as well, she knew I was just like, you know, like, like a dog. Yeah, it was, it was like that. Because, you know, I just, I love winning. I really did. And I am that feisty person. I'm competitive and I am ambitious. She did it with my sister and it was completely the other effect. My sister's a completely different personality. My sister, you have to nurture. My sister, you have to kind of leave on her own a little bit. She's, a, she's a, more of a loner. But for me, it's like, I, want, I see a trophy. I want to get trophy. How am I going to get trophy? I need to win. Um, and so by doing what she did, she allowed me to make those choices that I wanted to get better. And so it did, you know, it, it happens and I started improving. Um, and I was age 12 when it finally happened. So it took five years, but I finally beat my mum. So those of you who know that feeling of beating a parent, you're like, yes. Uh, I lapped, you know, did the lap of the, the tin heart that we train in over and over again. Mum stormed off, threw her racket in the corner, proper sulked for about two months. But I was like... Na, 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 na. so I was just loving it mom turned around and she went I'm not playing you anymore I was like you're kidding me absolutely kidding me get back on that court now um but she was having none of it she was having absolutely none of it um and this is what another thing she taught me and this is one of the things that I really want to go across as well is that my mom said to me there's no point in playing me anymore you're too good so you have to find someone else who's better than you and you start down at the bottom and you start working your way up again, like a ladder. I mean, how to kill a moment or what, but you know, I mean, at age 12, I wasn't really sure what she meant. And it's another of those lessons that I am so, so grateful. So she taught me the importance of losing. And, you know, so after a lovely um, introduction about the medals that I won, actually I've lost a lot more times than I've won. And it's those moments of losing, trying to climb that ladder that you learn the most. So losing is always learning. And I think it's sometimes it's really, we forget that very, very easily in the moment. We forget that, oh my God, I'm a loser. I'm rubbish. No, you're not. <laughs> you just didn't win at that time, at that moment. And that's resilience. And that's the, that's the essence of resilience. Resilience is not being... It's not being stupid and doing, you know, keep losing and just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Resilience is right now, I have not won. Resilience is I am not at this moment, not good enough. That doesn't mean that tomorrow is going to be the same as today. I accept the situation, situation now, but it does not mean that this is going to be the future. And it's a really good mindset to have. Losing is not failing. Losing is learning. And then when you start look, looking at it like that, suddenly everything becomes a challenge and it becomes interesting and it becomes exciting. And that, I think, is probably the best thing that I ever, ever did as a teenager. So I took on boys and the boys were like, oh, I'm not playing against you. You're a girl, you know. And I was like, bring it on. Now, if they beat me, they beat me. But I love the challenge. And if I won, it was like, there you go. You know, it's, it's that don't be scared of the challenge never ever be afraid of it you know and always do aim and always try and play those people that are better than you because you will learn so much more than the ones that you play an equal game with you might have lots of fun with those and it's always nice to win now and again don't get me wrong but the learning you get from that pushing yourself outside the comfort zone is that's where we improve the most in sport 
Um, so after sort of a quite a big, you know, learning curve in badminton, I did start improving the ranks in the, in the English kind of in the English tournaments. Um, I think I was about 15 when I saw an Olympic Games for the first time. And I just went, this is incredible. This is the Olympic Games. And I remember watching Sally Gunnell in 400 meter hurdles, 92 Barcelona Olympics. So I'm showing my age. Um, and I just remember thinking, this is it. That's where I want to be. I want to be an Olympian because there are suddenly I saw strong women. I saw women with muscles. Again, you know, sort of, you know, showcasing women more in the media, all different body types, personality types, you know, feisty people who wanted to win things. Really, really important. You know, we see we're inundated with the footballers and the cricketers and rugby players and but we don't see the women so much. So when a sporty girl comes along, she's called a tomboy. I'm like, no, I'm not a tomboy. I'm a girl who loves sport. But watching the Olympic Games suddenly opened my eyes that there were people like me and it's okay to be sporty and it's okay to have muscles. This is good. Um, and I remember walking into school and I just went, I want to be an Olympian. And they just laughed at me and they just went, sports for boys, you know, that, that was literally the attitude. It's not a job. You, you won't ever be able to do that. So think of a career because, you know, you're not going to be Olympian. Um, but, you know, so in the back of my mind, I said, like, okay, well, fine. You know, I did my education and stuff, but I really did want to be, you know, that was just have this image of that podium and Sally Gunnell on the, on the, on the top with her gold medal. I was like, well, well, Sally can do it. Why can't I do it? And there was no one seemed to be kind of, you know, sort of helping me on that. Uh, I think I was 18 when we heard about the UK sport lottery funding. So there were these money grants that we were like, oh, you might some money so you could be a professional badminton player. We were like, wow, this is incredible. And it totally changed our whole perspective. And I just started playing with Nathan Robertson. We were European junior champions. We were number one in England. I think we won the, uh, I think we won world junior bronze medal. You know, so we were, we were doing pretty good. And I remember getting called into the uh, performance director's office and they sat me down and went, so Gail, uh, you've done really well, um, but we think it's all Nathan and not you. So we're not going to fund you. You're not an actually talented badminton player. You're, you're not really that skillful. Um, you know, you're, you're okay, but we just don't believe in you. We don't think you're going to be an Olympian or a world, go to a world championship. So thank you very much. But, yeah sorry not for us and it was like okay <laughs> wasn't what I expected um I remember walking out of the office thinking wow but you I believed it because performance director and they're the expert and they just told me you know that I wasn't good enough and it was Nathan that was, that was great so I just thought well I'll do something else then so I went to university had a fantastic time for three years studied partied a lot it was brilliant it was absolutely brilliant but my heart was always you know I played a little bit of badminton did a bit of training but I did other sports as well but there was something still a little bit maybe unfinished business that kind of feeling and I remember playing a tournament when I finished uh university just to see if I can you know just wanted to know what my level was and I found some rackets from somewhere it turns up and oh my gosh I didn't I didn't win the tournament but I did okay but I also beat some of the people that they were being funded. And in my head, I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've just beaten some of the ones that you said were better than me. Um, and I've been pretty much at uni for three years doing no training whatsoever. And I thought, well, how's that? The Sydney Olympics are two, two years away. I might give this a shot, you know, sort of like, hmm, you know, sort of, hmm, 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 hmm. That's, that's kind of the, the feeling I had. They still wouldn't fund me fully, so I had to work. Um, I was a bar, bar girl, I was a waitress. So I would train in the day and then work until midnight, one in the morning, it, you know, do it clean in the bar and all that sort of lovely stuff. Um, and so I did all that. And then, you know, that's just to try and see where I was going. But obviously, because I was training more, I was improving. And obviously, it's the Olympic qualification that came around, I think, for mixed doubles. It was, it was looking like you had to be in the top 16 of the world rankings at that point. It's a really, really tight um, qualification. And when the final rankings came out for qualification, I finished 17th. So that was there. I wasn't going to go. Um, and it was horrible. It was just like, you know, Olympics every four years. It's not going to happen. Um, 
And I think it was just one of those moments where I just, it was like being punched in the stomach and then watching it on TV and I was like, oh, I'm not there, you know? And I think when I say, you know, about sport being, you have to be honest in sports and because you have to be, it's your true self on that court. It's your, you know, there's no hiding place. In these moments, there's no hiding place either because I had to answer the questions, why are you not there? And I don't think I worked hard enough. I knew I could still get better, but I didn't know how to push myself that extra bit more. That makes sense. I felt like I was always holding myself back. So at 23, I hadn't really learned how to get out of my comfort zone in training, how to get out of my comfort zone in a match, how to push myself that little bit more, which is really, really scary. It's not something that's natural for girls as well. It was, if I go there, that, I'm going to another place. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm not going to be Gail anymore. I'm going to be Gail Badminton player. I am going to have to train harder than I've ever had to train before. I'm going to have to almost make myself physically sick every single day because I need to push my boundaries all the time. And I had to learn how to do that. And not only do that, but I've got to do it every day for four, for four years if I want to go to the Olympic Games. And that's really, really brutal. But there's something very, very empowering when it happens. And when I did say, right, this is what I'm going to do, four years, every day, push that comfort zone, step out of it, push the boundaries all the time. It was tough. It was tough here. But once it started, it became normal. It became normal to do that. And suddenly my level went from 17 in the world to suddenly I was number four in the world and I was back playing with Nathan. And people were starting to take notice. So I'm like, oh, hello, Gail. <laughs> Where's she come from? And I was like, yeah. I mean, it took a while for it to sink in. And it took a while for me to learn how I could do it with, my, with myself. But like I say, it was very empowering when it happened. And when walking around Athens 2004 and was wearing the Team GB tracksuit and, you know, you suddenly look back, you think it's worth it. Pain and that's pushing yourself and that, oh, yeah, just, oh, it's, it's, it's kind of addictive pain in a way because it is so, so hard. You just suddenly go, yeah, I'm at the Olympic Games, so I'm at my dream this is why you do it. Um, and you need people, like I say, constantly, I will always say this over and over again. I thought of all the people that kept me going because I had so many bad days. Every day I was just like, oh, I'm not good enough. I can't do this anymore. But they're the ones that are just like, you can do this girl. Come on, this is your dream. You can keep going. We, we believe in you. And they're the ones that, that got me there. They're the ones that, you know, that I was walking around the team GB village for. Uh, so we were in the final, we were up against China, uh, the reigning champions, and um, you know, I, I could still can't watch that match, it's, it's haunts me forever, because we were leading in that third, and we, we didn't get the gold medal. Um, so I have got my medal here, it's a little bit battered, I don't know if you can see it with the lights, and there it is, there we go. Um, so old now, it's unbelievable. Um, so hopefully some of you remember it, um, the older ones remember it. Um, but yeah, so I see this and I think, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to like sell it on eBay, but I'm only like 90% happy with it because it's not gold. I stood on that podium and I just looked up and I was like, I'm on gold. Yeah. Um, in my eyes, I could, I, I've had this feeling as well. I was just like, I know I can still get better. So I'm not happy with it. I remember coming off the podium and, you know, I was, I was crying and everyone's like, oh, you know, well done, you won silver. And I'm like, I'm on gold. I can get better. And we, you know, some of the team around us, you know, there's the coaches, the physios, the doctors, nutritionists, everyone around us. So we'll just look to each other and went, well, let's do it. Let's get gold for more years. Let's do it in Beijing. And it was like this incredible moment where we all put our hands in and we all just went, let's do this. And it was that gold medal mentality thinking, which I think is so, so important. You need that in the whole group. You need that, um, everyone on the same page. 
and it does lift you even though it's me and Nathan on that court it there's so much of it needs to be behind the scenes because they're the energy that helps push us helps us train harder helps us keep that motivation going and it works because we won the European Championships, we won the Commonwealth Games. And then, yeah, two years later, after the Olympic silver, we ended up winning the world gold. So there it is. Um, I recommend it. It's a great feeling. You wake up in the morning, you're like, today's a good day, number one in the world. Uh, if I have a bad day, um, I come home, wear the medal. Makes everything all right, definitely. I've even done the school run wearing the medal. Yeah, so those of you who are parents and uh, you get stressed out, wear a medal. Um, <laughs> I recommend it. I don't tell anyone because the mums will all laugh at me around here. Um, but, you know, the one thing we had one was the Olympic gold. And I, I knew that this was going to be my last go, my last effort, my last chance at it. I knew that I'll probably retire after Beijing. Um, so when Nathan said... Oh, we've got the, you know, the poster pair <laughs> of Beijing, the first round. I was like, yeah, yeah, the pair that we'd not beaten before. Yay. Um, yeah, the girl who beat us four years before. Yay. Great. Uh, her new partner with the world record smash. Yay. It was just like, you are kidding me. Um, the one pair that we didn't want, we had them in the first round. And I remember walking out to the course and then, um, you know, so four people cheering, you know, my mom, my dad, Nathan's mum and Nathan's dad, and that was it. Um, and then when the Chinese pair came, walked out, it was just like 10,000 people started screaming and cheering. So we were always knew we were up against it. Um, we were losing. No, we won the first, lost the second, and we were losing by quite a lot in the third. And I just remember thinking, I am not using this. My mum's come all the way from Bedford. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of moment. Oh, I was just like... Oh, this stubbornness kicked in and we just sort of crept it back, crept it back. And we ended up winning 21-19 in the third. And so Nathan and I were like, woo, jumping up and down. Coaches were like, ah, you know, everyone was like, my mum was like, woo, go Kyle. And they realised that 10,000 people were just staring at us and just going, you've just basically beaten our post there. And they were properly staring. We had to have security utter us out. It was that bad. But we were buzzing. Everyone was like, this is it. We're going to win the gold medal. Because, you know, oh, my God, we've just beaten the, the favourites, the gold medal favourites. Uh, next round, quarterfinals, we're up against Korea. And we've beaten them before. So we were, we were, you know, kind of knew the tactics and quite confident. And I remember going out there. We, it was an amazing match. And Nathan and I played really, really well. The Koreans just went and played a little bit better. And we lost. Um, the Koreans went on to win the gold medal. So we beat the favourites and lost the eventual winners. But in my eyes, I didn't get the gold medal. I didn't win. And I remember walking off the course and it was all trying to process it and, you know, thinking that wasn't supposed to happen. And I remember the sort of the TV cameras, the microphone, and they were sort of like, you know, how are you feeling right now, girl? And I just remember crying my eyes out because all the emotion was coming out that that was it. Um, my mum came over and she gave me this massive hug and I swear to God, my mum said this. She, she turned around, she looked at me, she went, did you try your best? And I was a bit like, yes, mum, it's the Olympic Games. I think I tried my best, you know, it's, like, oh, it's so embarrassing, you know, it's so kind of did that to her. Um, and it was only later that evening, I just had this moment and just went, oh my God, my mum's right, you know, and. And I will say this over and over again, that I really was the best badminton player that I could be. I proved so many people wrong. And I've told you, uh, you know, so the performance director 18, if you'd have asked me the coaches when I was younger, if you've asked my mom, you know, do you think I would be an Olympian? They would have all laughed at you. And I, and I can't emphasize that enough. When I say that I was not the most naturally talented badminton player, I really wasn't okay there were lots of shots in badminton that I can't do and and I, I laugh at it and I, and I don't mind I don't care you know and this is probably one of the reasons why I don't coach because can you teach us the uh, cross court net shot and I go mm, nope find a clip of me of doing cross court net shot you won't be able to because I can't do it um, I also can't reverse slice either so um yep yeah, can't do reverse slice never have been able to just just my wrist doesn't work that way uh, again, my backhand is shocking, absolutely shocking. 
Um, it's all right, backhand defense, but anywhere, you know, sort of deep, <sighs> no, not a chance. So what did I do? I made my strengths absolutely amazing. I'm five foot three. So what I did was, did it around, you know, made myself really fast so I could get around in my forehands. I'm also really, really strong, very strong in my legs. That made me very powerful to do crouch defense. It made me able to jump. It made me able to be so fast in that court. Uh, I could smash quite hard and I was, my reactions were incredible. So anything that came, you know, around here at the net, that was it. That was my zone. There was nothing going past me. So even at world number one, I still had lots of weaknesses, but that's what I want to kind of tell you. You don't, you don't have to, there's no such thing as a perfect badminton player. You just have to make them play to your strengths. That's all you do. And Nathan and I complimented each other very well because he was that skillful person. But mentally, he was a little bit up and down, whereas I was like, you know, come on, let's do this. And I was that steady one that just kept him going. So there's always ways around it. There is never, there's no such thing as, like I say, a perfect badminton player or a perfect athlete. It's just making sure you know your strengths and weaknesses it's making sure that you maximize your strengths and always work on your weaknesses all the time never ever try and be perfect because it just won't happen it's never going to so don't even try to do it um i had a fantastic coach with andy wood who always allowed me to be the best me he said you will always can be be compared in sports so people are like oh you're gonna be the next joe good i was like well, no, I can't be in the next skirt, Jogu, because she's about four inches taller than me. She's a completely different style player. So how can I be the next Jogu when I'm completely nothing like her? So it's about being the best you. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. Um, and that's a trouble in sport. We, we will always will do. It's just so normal to say it. But when people do, just, just ignore it. Say, well, actually, yeah, that's great that they do that. But I do it this way. And the best athletes are the ones that are the best. They understand that the most on that court. So don't try and be anyone else. As again, I'll say again, you know, you'll get found out if you try and pretend to be somebody. And Andy was always the person to say that, you know what, it doesn't matter. You know, I want you to feel good on that court. It's nothing worse than making yourself feel rubbish on that, on that badminton court. It's just, it's just awful. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, he always, you know, straight away, first session was like, right, we're going to do neck kills. So I was like, yes, so it's not good. Then he said, right, what do you want to work on? And it was my choice. Do I feel good and want to work on my weaknesses or do I just not want to go there? So it's about being the best you as a badminton player. Um, another thing I was about to say is like um, trust is a big one that I want to really talk about as well. Every day as an athlete, it's a balance, and in life actually, to be fair, it's a balance between trust and fear. So right now, with all what's going on, fear is quite high in all of us. Fear of what normality looks like. Fear of, <gasps> oh yeah, what is going on in the world at the moment. As an athlete, we have that fear goes quite high. We doubt ourselves. Are we good enough? Am I going to let people down? You know, that, those are the feelings. Have I done enough training? Well, actually, how do we get this trust side? That's what's so important. We need that trust up. So... How do we get that trust up? Who are the people that get us going, you know what, you are good. You have done the training. You do belong here. You are awesome. And that is what's really important. This trust is so, so good. It's not, don't get it confused with ego, or arrogance, or you know, overconfidence. Trust is that self-belief that's here in your heart, knowing that you've done the hard work. Trust that it will be okay. And that is key for sports people. You need that fear because obviously we need the, the drive to get up and do the training. We don't want it too high because we just doubt ourselves over and again. And there's nothing worse than that. So yeah, trust. Who's in that support team to help you get that trust up? And last one, you know, I sort of mentioned a roller coaster, um, but really it's about adaptability. There will never be <laughs> a straight line. I'll emphasize it again. Uh, my, the, I don't know what will you call mine. It would definitely, I don't think it'd be the work. You wouldn't even be able to make it a roller coaster because it would be deemed way too dangerous. Health and safety would be like, uh, uh-uh, you, you can't have that because it's just like all over the shop. So if you can, you know, hear it from me, like how much of a roller coaster my my badminton career or my badminton journey has been. You know, have confidence that 
there is no such thing as a, a line that's going to be the perfect path anywhere. And that's in badminton, in sport or in life. You have to be adaptable. And we can't have resilience without it. Remember that resilience comes in when we accept the situation right now. That doesn't mean that's going to happen tomorrow. What we're going to do, we're going to do it today, but tomorrow is another day. Um, I'm very aware that I've been talking quite a lot. Um, so, yeah, I might hand over to Michael now and see if there's any questions that have come through at all. Yeah, firstly, what can I say, Gail? Um, I think I'm echoing the words of uh, everybody else, but what an inspiring talk. And uh, there is one comment that comes in here, and, and I'm going to read it out, and I'm also going to read out the person's name because they put it beside it and they haven't told me I can't but it says I'm so inspired Gail listening to you it makes me want to take up the racket again and that's Yay. from Trudy Kennedy so Gail if ever you're thinking of coming <laughs> home and playing come on Trudy the come Masters on. I think you have yourself a ladies doubles partner yes <laughs> Woo. um yeah so there you go Trudy um Gail there's a couple of questions in here and one kind of touches on a subject that I had kind of wanted to talk to you about anyway and I suppose, look, you said at the start, you're a very honest, open person, and you have been quite open about, I suppose, life after retirement and from the, from the high to the low and all of that, and, and I suppose the, the difficulties that you had. And the question is, how did you deal with the first step after retiring from professional badminton? So I suppose... Yeah, it's a tough the, one. Therein lies the question. Yeah, it's a really, really tough one. And like I say, I will be honest about it. Any anyone if I if I could go back I would prepare myself better from transition because it's no one can no one can teach you what you what's going to go through here and here so it's your heart in your head you know hopefully you've got a sense of how much it was my life and it was you know I was so used to doing badminton every day training 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 and you know having goals and then suddenly when you come out of it you have this initial high you're like woo I can eat chocolates I can have a McDonald's and you're like really happy and then I can be me and then suddenly you go oh my god but who am I who, who is Gail because I've lost her because I have been Gail M's badminton player for so long such a big part of my life and such an intense part of my life how do I who am I I don't even know what I'm good at I just know I'm good at badminton that is it and when you come out of the real world you suddenly and into real world you suddenly realize that no one cares that you can hit a badminton shuttle really hard. They want to know what other skills you've got. And I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue because I was so used to being a badminton player. So I literally just dipped and I dipped into it and we call it the grievance curve. And that's what you do. You have to grieve and let go of something that's been so passionate and part of your life. You have to grieve an identity. And again, this is something that I really hope athletes in elite sport have to learn about they they need to know this will happen so how can we prepare and I think it's about life coaching it's about business coaching keep teaching skills while sports people are sports people understanding who they are personality wise understanding that they have got other skills other than sport you know it's and, and doing courses as well you know keeping the um, you know this going in in another sense and I think that is what we have to do I honestly because it, it's just yeah uh, sport is such a specific um, you know everything's done for you and then when you come out of it it was like the biggest shock of my life so yeah it was tough really can I ask really you tough a question Gail about mm. your, your work can I ask you a question a bit about your work with um uh, if I've done my research correctly, LAPS, yeah. you're, you're, you're a marketing manager with Life After Professional Sports. So it seems to me that maybe you've looked at your own career and thought, well, OK, this is what happened to me when I retired. And how can I help others prepare for retirement? So talk yeah, to so LAPS is a great organisation that they work with companies that recognise the skills that athletes have. So athletes do have this like fiery ambition and they have that determination. And they do like taking instruction and they do love a challenge. So we look at companies that really recognize that and we work with them and we get athletes into those companies. So someone who's looking to transition from rugby or from rowing or it doesn't matter the sport, but they know that they're coming to the end and then we match the two together. So what we're trying to get is companies to recognize that 
this rower, for instance, might not have the marketing, um, you know, qualification that someone else has had, but what they have got is this, this, and this, a huge network of people, um, you know, the ability to go and t talk in a big room, you know, all those other skills that, you know, potentially other people have, haven't got. So that's what we're trying to do. And suddenly businesses are like, oh my gosh, yeah, actually, we've not thought about this. And all these sports people out there, we're like, yeah, <laughs> we have got skills. We don't know it, but if we have nurturing, we could be very, very good and very, very, you know, sort of, um, yeah worthy to a company so that's what i do i have to say it's a fantastic um example of somebody who has kind of lived it and kind of stopped and looked back and thought well you know what could i do now to make a difference yeah. for future athletes so that maybe they don't um i suppose fall as as hard as i yeah. did so i mean i was very interested to hear that um I, i'm going to move on towards some other questions because we're coming in um, this question is coming in from a lady called Imelda Breen, who we all know. Um, she says, hi, Gail, thanks for this evening. Could I ask you how you approach the game? And you may have answered this already. How, how, would, how you approach the game against an opposition where you previously hadn't won again against them? How to stay positive and keep confident as you went through oh, the game? Oh, <laughs> um, really good question. Um, if I haven't beaten them before, so... I always think, so, you know, again, it's that fear and that trust. So the fear is obviously they're going, you know, oh my God, they beat me 10 times. I haven't got close. So the fear is obviously going to be there. But then I have this kind of really, um, uh, as the saying that I use that, um, I don't know if you've got any younger members of the audience, but there's an, a swear word at the start and then it's swear word it. That's it. It's like, I'm me, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go out there, show them what I've got. Now, I can't control my opponent whatsoever. I've got no magic wands, but I can control what I do. And if I go out there and go, oh, you know, they're better than me, then they've already won. If I'm like, come on then, come on, because I've got this, you know, and I have that attitude, then I'm controlling me and I'm controlling what I can do. And I'm controlling that I am up here and I'm going to give everything. And that is all you can do. Now, they might come out. You might be like, come on, you might play the best game of your life and you still lose. But you know what? You can say, I played the best game of my life. And I had that control. And I had that choice to do that. And that's the most important thing. But you, that's the only thing you can do if, you are, if this is the ranking and you're down here and they're up there. Literally, just go for it. You have nothing to lose. But it's your attitude that will make the difference. And yeah everyone loves a challenge and you know what underdogs have their day and that's that's what that's why we play sport for that that moment of an underdog seeing that you know top dog yeah. i think you think your 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 mother made a really really good she asked you a really good question which was did you do your best and and i suppose the only thing once you look at yourself in the mirror and you go did i do everything yeah. i could while i was out there well then if you lose it's you're disappointed but at least you're saying well I did everything I could. Exactly. Um, so th th that's, that's a good yeah. answer. A question, from an a question from an anonymous attendee. What advice would you give to somebody who has not played competitively for a few years but would like to get back to a high level? Ooh, okay. And that's not for me, <laughs> by the way. Really. Um, you know what? Start slowly, okay? Don't suddenly go rush into it because you'll, you'll probably have a shock to the system. Start slowly, get that love back, get the enjoyment back, make sure your body's in the best, best shape possible it can be. Learn to love that journey, keep that going, and then when you feel ready, do it. Don't look back and go, oh, I wish I played in like a few more tournaments, or I wish, I'd, wish I could see if I could have done that. Never. If you feel like that, get up there, get back training, get back into it, and do it. Don't ever have regrets, because... You're just sort of, it, there's nothing worse than sport. And you can hear it in people when they've got regrets in sport. You can always say, oh, yeah, I could have done this. Or I could have done that. Don't be that person. Go, you know what? I thought, I did, you know, it's, you want to be that person who tried, didn't try because they thought they'd fail. Be that per. be brave and go for it. Like I said, but start slowly. Don't just go, ah, <laughs> go back into it. Get your body up, get ready for it, and then go for it. But don't ever have regrets. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say do it. 
there's another question here which I think um, taps nicely into something you mentioned earlier on because I, I did hear you talk about um, when you got your Olympic silver medal that you you um, you were quite honest and you said that you felt that you were the mm. weakest person on court and it was a it was a feeling that you didn't like at all and you swore it would never happen again and we all know where it took you to so the question here is how did you deal with the mental disappointments when matches slipped away from you um the first of all i'd have a big strop and i would cry uh i'm gonna gotta have a big strop i love a big strop i love it i there's nothing wrong with a big strop because I'm, I react first with my emotions. So I need to get that out first. So I get that out and then my head can process it. So there's no point holding an emotion in. Everyone's different. So for me, get the emotion out. Then my head starts processing it, processing it. And I don't like losing. So again, straight away, I kick in the challenge. I'm going to beat them next time. And I will just go and it suddenly become, I turn the disappointment into they're going to lose next time. And it, and it does, but you have to get the emotion out first before you can mentally process. Um, yeah. The head start the head bit comes in. And I think that's the key for people. Sometimes um, sport and emotion can get, the emotion can take over and that's when you can, it goes a little bit. Yeah. Frantic. So yeah, I, I, I flip it straight away, get the emotion out, flip, right that's what's happened today. That's not going to happen next time. Uh, the best person who was really good for that was Rexy Manneke. Um, when we had him as a coach, he was brilliant and able helping me turn that because I would get emotional and think I'm not good enough. I'm never going to beat them. And he just made me look him in the eye and said, you're not going to lose them again. You're going to beat them next time. And it was like, you know, and I, and I sort of went, Oh gosh, you can't say that. Oh, you know, Really, really good, you know. And he just went, "You are going to beat them next time." And that, if you start saying that, and then you start believing it, then you do it. Yeah, I think. I think, in fairness, uh, you know what you just said. The proof is in the pudding that you you turned an Olympic silver medal in two thousand and four into a world champ gold in uh, two thousand and six. So. There's your answer to your question. <laughs> I have another question here about. Um, I suppose we've all seen um, Nathan play many times uh, over the years. I've been fortunate enough. I've actually played against him once. Um, clearly got beaten, but it, it was a privilege to say that. Um, but um, the question here is: Did you and Nathan? Um, uh, sorry, there's two questions here. I'm picking one of them. It says: How did did both yourself and Nathan deal? with training together and was there a dominant partner in the pairing? Sorry, I missed the first bit of the question. Sorry, my son just walked in. So um, what's the yeah. first bit? Sorry. It, it basically says, how did both yourself and Nathan, sorry, oh, sorry. two questions here from the one person. Um, basically the question is, was there a dominant partner in the pairing with yourself and Nathan? Yes. Uh, so basically at the start, um, because I, I was kind of like the one just coming into it and he was like already established. I felt very, oh my God, I'm playing with Nathan Robertson. And I felt down here and he was up there. And that's what it was like in the Olympic final. After the Olympic final, I just realized you should never, ever feel below somebody, your partner. And again, flipped it when I am equal to Nathan. Obviously not, you know, obviously if we played against each other, he's, he'd beat me. He'll not mean like that. I mean, equal is we both deserve to be on that court. And that is how we're going to be. Mm. And in mixed doubles, the girl has to be dominant because you are on the front of the court and you see everything. Now, Nathan's running around going, well, I'm doing all that stuff at the back of the court, but I'm watching and I can see the gaps. And sometimes he can't see the gaps all the time. So the girl has to learn to be the dominant one in the sense of, what the hell are you doing? There's a bloody gap there. Why are you hitting it over there? You know, you need to do it here, here, here. So you have to have the confidence to be, I am equal with the guy. I deserve to be on this court. And you know what? Sometimes I'm going to be up here because I'm the one telling him. So you have to learn to do that. And it does not mean in equal in, it means stepping up when you need to. Dominance, it could be, it's a character trait. It doesn't mean that you are better than somebody or, you know, that other person doesn't, oh God, why they, oh, I've got to play with them. 
doesn't mean that at all. It means being at that moment, understanding that you're both equal and sometimes you're the one who has, to, who has to talk. And that's really important, especially for women in mixed doubles because, because they are the weaker one, you know, they're like, oh God, made a mistake again, or it's singles with a handicap or whatever the comments are normally. Um, so the girls suddenly, suddenly feel like, oh, you know, okay. Ooh. And so we go like this and suddenly we're always down here. And actually, no, I'm on this court with you. Listen to me me and do as i say that's how it should be yeah so equal but equal but very yes. different and clearly mixed is a game where uh, there's two very very different skill sets and uh, personally i think mix is the best game because but when you blend if you look at yourself and nathan if you blend your very different skill sets together yeah. we've all seen how fantastic it can yeah. be and and that resulted in olympic silver medal and a world championship gold can i ask you um a question here uh can you talk a bit about your mental preparation for important matches? This is from somebody called Roman. So mental preparation is different for everyone. Um, so sometimes uh, my nerves, oh, I was a complete nervous state. So I used to have all crazy nerves. Sometimes I was so nervous. I was jump, you know, bouncing off the walls. Sometimes I was so nervous I was physically sick. Sometimes I was so nervous I would be falling asleep. So my body would kick in the other way. So a bit like a narcolepsy. So sometimes I'll just be like that, you know, sort of about to go on court. So my mental preparation was all about keeping the balance of my fear and trust. So obviously if I'm playing against someone that's better than me, I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Oh, they were so good. I've never beat them before. So how do I get that down? How do I get the trust? You know what? Get out there. You've done your hard work. You know your tactics. You're awesome. You can go out there and do your best, you know. It, it is mental preparation. It's just purely that because with the nerves, you're going bing, bing, oh, like that. And, and that's, that's the key is how do I keep myself in that right prime ready position where I'm going to go out there and perform my best. Now I know I perform my best when I've got this, that's my level. So I've still got fear, but the trust isn't too, you know, it's not cockiness. It's there, but I don't want my fear to be there. So I know that that's my level. So Everyone's different. Some people work, perform best when they're here. Some perform best when they're here. So that's why it's really key when we're talking about self-reflection and knowing who you are. This is where you need to find what's your level. And then how to, who are the people so how do I, you know, around you? Because you're not always going to be able to do that on your own. So you might go, help, <laughs> help, I'm up here. I need to be here. You know, that's, that's where your team comes in. That's where your coach comes in, your partners. That's how they can help you. Music can help you get into the right mood and stuff like that. Little phrases, a, a diary, um, a thoughts diary, feelings diary, anything like that, whatever works for you to get your prep, your right level. That's the key. There's a nice compliment in here, which I'm going to read out. And it's from a, I believe she's a Waterford girl uh, called Anya Morrissey and it's simply really thank Gail for changing the way I played mixed doubles. I learned from watching her positioning on the court. So that's a very nice from a girl called Anya Morrissey. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, no, honestly, I think, again, finding, and, uh, having another, confidence. Yeah. God, another question in, another question in here uh, from chap called Danny O'Brien and it leads me to something I did want to ask you and it says hi Gail great chat and insights into the pro game do you read many books and if so what ones would you recommend that stood out to you thanks in advance the thing is I know you you've become an author and you've actually you hook out don't you I do have a book out but it's probably not one that's not going to help you badminton or any sporting career it's good. it might, help it might do yeah it could I mean it definitely tests your sporting knowledge but yeah I have got a quiz sport, a sports quiz book out so um yeah that's that was quite never ever thought I'd have a book out in my life but that's what to get got me through the first lockdown here in England um and I did it on Twitter just put these questions out just to try and have a bit of fun actually it was it all started with um Keith Gillespie a uh, footballer and it's a bit of a joke between me and him and it ends up becoming a book so all these random things uh, books are very very interesting um there's not one book that has the whole package in my eyes I've learned lots of little bits of books um I love learning from other sports people the best so actually whether it's an autobiography or not um 
I actually think that we learn lots from other people. Um, so I learned lots. Um, there's a rower, Catherine Granger. She's now the head of UK Sold eventually in, did she win gold in London? She did eventually win gold in London. And loads from her just, just by talking and, and, you know, sort of connecting and understanding each other's trainings and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think, I think it's about sort of experiences because sometimes too much theory, I like, oh, must try this, must try that. You'll read loads of books, but only little things will just will trigger in. So there's not one book that I found. I find talking to other athletes the most inspiring and actually learn most there. Okay, okay. Um, a question here from a chap called Richard Hudson, who I know quite well, who's a, a coach in a juvenile club in Nina, which is where I'm from. And he says, Gail, what is the best mixed doubles training exercise you would recommend for juveniles, say under 15s? Oh, under 15s. Um, anything Put where you the get... Now. Yeah, I know. Uh, so basically, under 15 level, you need the girls to have confidence. That's all it is. So we, and if, any, any tips, uh, or any exercises, that those girls feel great. So that is your key. Because at that level, the boys are starting to mature and get stronger, and they're going to hit, start hitting it harder, and suddenly going to look at the girls and go, and do the, and roll the eyes. So any exercises where you make that girl feel like the best player, that's what you need to do. And that can be all sorts. It could be, you know, sort of, um, you know, um, putting sort of handicaps on the boys if you can only play certain shots. A uh, girl can step in on and score double when she, when she does a, a soft shot or she finds the gap. So everything, so the girl comes out the best, mm -hmm. that's the best one for that age group. Okay, and I have another question here. Um... Um, and it's, I suppose, this person is saying that they realise you're a big Spurs fan and they're wondering um, if you think Jose Mourinho is the man oh, to uh, turn fortunes oh. around the Spurs. No, I don't think he's the person. I'm just checking on the score, actually, because they're playing now, aren't they? Uh, what is the score? We're one nil up. Woo! <laughs> um, do I th oh, see, we've got, we've got such an attacking team. We've got, like, Harry Kane... Son, we've got Bale, we've got Mora, we've got Deli Ali is just coming to front. We've got these amazing players, but is he the right person? I don't know. He's just too. Oh, he's too Jose Mourinho. That's the problem. I think we, when we had Pochettino, he steadied the ship. He he got, he got that team atmosphere. He got that team ethos together. That was so key. And you can feel it, can sense it. I don't think Jose's got everyone on board. Um, so no, I don't I don't think it's the right person. I think he's about folks, 75 you, you've, heard it, you've heard it tonight. If you want to know anything about football, and particularly football in London, uh, Gail Ems is the, <laughs> the lady you need to speak to. Um, th there's a, th what prompted me to ask that was, there was a girl here, Rachel Chong. She's asked a question. She's Rach, uh, sorry, hi Gail. Thank you for your time today. A few questions. Uh, do you have any involvement in badminton right now? And if not, would you like to? And, and I suppose, secondly, she's saying, um, what do you think NGBs could do to improve badminton for women and young girls, especially coaching? Yeah, I, well, but you've basically answered it there for me. So I'm not involved in badminton. I would like to be involved in badminton, but there isn't anything, involved, there isn't anything to help me get involved into badminton, which is, which is what we need to do. I should be involved with badminton and it's I feel embarrassed that I'm not um if I was in another country say I was in Denmark with their clubs I would be involved because it's with so many so much more opportunity for me we don't have that stuff. so there's not it's not easy for me to go and you know join a club and become a coach at a club I can't I can't necessarily become a national coach because I've got two boys and I, the lifestyle doesn't, you know, work with being a mum. But I could do it with a club, mm. but we don't have a club system. So I'm like, well, what do I do? You know, it's, it's really, really hard. And um, I, think, I think England, UK, needs to look at its sports system. I don't agree with the UK sports system, for instance. I agree that we need to grow the community club system better. We need to grow the, the county system better. I think it's shocking how we've let it go. 
Um, but it's all about, you know, building these big sports centers, um, multi-sports centers when we've lost that, that really lovely badminton club set up that I grew up with and probably many people did. And now, you know, it's, it doesn't exist so much. So if we had that, then I'd be able to do more with the club, but I just haven't got that. Yeah, I think club badminton is very, very important. And as somebody yeah. who came up through the club system and, um, yeah. even met my wife through the club system and I think she's actually logged on somewhere Yay. tonight so I'm going to embarrass <laughs> her um, but um, hi Leslie um, a question from a good friend of mine Michael Troy he says where do you see badminton England as a force in world badminton today compared to when you and Nathan were at the height of your powers and what does uh, I'm not sure if that's badminton. What does badminton England need to do to compete on the world stage going forward? I'm not sure whether that's BE or BI. I think it's, but I it, will, it will be appropriate to everyone. I think um, any European nation, because even Denmark is struggling at the moment, I think the, na the Asian nations have just got another gear. I mean, you've got other nations such as, so when I was competing, we were always beating the Japanese, for instance. J Japan were good, but we were beating them. Now they're then I'm one of the top best in the world. Um, same with Korea. They are just, you know, uh, there'll be one or two good pairs, but now there's lots of good pairs. Taiwan as well. Um, nations that we were beating regularly are now, they've upped their game. France. Yeah. And they've just, got loads, they've just got loads more players, you know, and we don't have that. We are, it's a great thing in, the, in Europe that we have so many other sports you know we've got I mean you could do there's a sport for everyone which is great but it means that we can't get that pool of players for one sport we have it in, well obviously in England we have it for football you know there's so many boy footballers but then when you start going down down the, down kind of the list of minority sports suddenly you know that pool gets yeah smaller and smaller and smaller but as you go to the Asian countries it's like ta -da, lots of balance and players and we just don't have that and it is a numbers game. Mainstream. And there's nothing, do you know what? There's nothing we can do. Yeah. It's that, I, I, I'd rather the Bamboo in England it, or, and accept the situation and say, right, okay, well, when we have got someone, let's just go for it. Because we're not going to have, we're not going to beat the Chinas or the, the Japans of this world. And, yeah. Mm. Of course, Japan have um, Park Jubangas, the one of their lead coaches well, out there. So. No surprise to see exactly. them doing so well. He, he's a former um, Olympic and world champion and, and um, certainly one of my heroes when I play. Um, Gail, can I ask you a question? This is a question from Trudy Kennedy. <laughs> and it basically says, my, uh, my what partner. advice would you give to clubs to encourage... Exactly, your doubles partner, yeah. Um, what advice would you give to clubs to encourage their juvenile players to stay in the game and not give up? Um, how would I do this? Okay, so for kids... It's about being cool and it's about FOMO so you have to and with girls it has to be an emotion right so if you can if you can tick those boxes and how to keep the kids there so you've got to make it why should we go there what is in it for us what are we going to get out of it um that's the key and and it's really hard with kids because is badminton the coolest thing? Mm, not really. There are other cool things, apparently, like, you know, sort of Xbox and, you know, uh, going to parties or whatever. So badminton is going to be down their list. But if badminton is a safe place, if badminton is a happy place for people, if badminton is a meeting place, if badminton is somewhere, you know what? It's not the coolest thing, but it's my place. If you can create that atmosphere in a club, uh, you make it welcoming, you make it special, you make uh, youngsters feel welcome. Um, and again, with the girls, why are they there? So is it an emotional connection with a teacher, a coach, sisters, mum, daughters? You know, why are they there? If you can get that atmosphere, then you, get the, you, you keep the youngsters and they'll always, they'll always be grateful for it. But that, that's hard and it does take work and it does take planning. It does take talking to the youngsters I'm under about pressure it. Here to, Sorry. I'm under a bit of pressure here. So I'm going to I have a few okay. quick, quick fire questions I want to ask you. Somebody here has, somebody here has posed an anonymous uh, question. And um, it basically says, um, a little bit controversial, I think, but here we go. Um, the Adcox versus Ellis and Smith, who's your favourite to uh, win? Right now, 
Ellison Smith. I would have said the other way a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah, I would have said the same. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, uh, there was one or two other. Yeah, a, a question. Um, knowing what you know, having the career you've had, and having the experience you had, um, I suppose when you when you had difficulties when you finished playing, what would you say today to an eighteen year old Gail Ems, um who wants who wants to basically start out again? What would you tell her, knowing what I you know? I would tell her to that you. I would say I would look myself in the eye and say you are stronger than you think you are. You are you can be fitter and stronger and faster than anyone else here. You just don't realize it. Go out there and push yourself because I didn't push myself at 18. I would also say about okay. being prepared. Okay, I um, I, yeah. yeah I, was, I was saying to you earlier, I had the pleasure of watching you and Nathan win the Portuguese Open when you were probably, I was trying to figure out the year earlier and I'm guessing you were about 18. So um, yeah. um, it was fantastic to see you go on to such great heights after that. Um, uh, a comment, just a couple of quick fire comments. Uh, this girl, Elisa Seddon, um, says, Gail has always been my idol and why I've kept pushing to be better at badminton. Got to have missed her at the All England last year. Thank you for giving back to the sport also. That's a, that's a oh, nice one. Um, now, let me see what else. Um, I, I'm just conscious that, that Sarah is, is uh, we need to wrap this up. Yeah, an anonymous attendee, somebody here says, thanks for remembering all the girls playing sport and how much support they need. I was the only girl with mega sporty <laughs> brothers. They were champions in team sports and had support everywhere around them. I hated it. <laughs> I played in brackets, ten, sorry, I play mm -hmm. tennis now as an adult, but I love taking girls to the court and getting them to find a new part of their personality in sport. Many yes. do not want to be champions, uh, or be the best they can. They just want to have fun. Some are very competitive. Let's remember the ones who aren't so competitive yeah. also, but sport can give them so, so much joy and personal development. Um, I suppose just one thing I, I want to finish up with. I, it's been inspirational listening to you, Gail. And what I would say is you're, you're somebody who has um, clearly been very, very open and honest with, I suppose, the challenges that being a professional athlete um, uh, created for you. And but I think more importantly, what it has shown is it has shown somebody who has had the strength to step forward and say, you know, I've had disappointments. But I think in the in the Rocky movie, it says it's not it's not how many times you get hit, it's how many times you can get back up. Yeah. And to convert that into an Olympic silver, not to be happy with that, and to convert that into a world championship gold medal, I think is truly inspirational. So what I'm going to say um. is. Um, uh, Gail Ems, thank you very much on behalf of um, Munster Badminton um, and particularly uh, my friend Trudy Kennedy, but also Badminton Ireland and women in sport. Oh, thank you so much. Sarah, Honestly, do you want to come back in? Pleasure. Hey, Hey, Dan. Um, look, I'm not going to say much more than Mike has already said. It's been absolutely brilliant. I'm sure everybody has learned something from this webinar. So as Mike said, thank you so much for taking part in this. And we really do hope all the attendees have learned something from tonight. So that's all from us. Thanks very much, Gail, again. And well, good night. Yeah, no, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Gail. Bye -bye. Thanks a million. Bye. Nice to speak with you. Bye-bye. All right.